everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. If you have been around my channel for a little while, you'll probably know that I collect antique clothing and I love sharing my antique clothing collection with all of you through my monthly video series where I go up close on the garments to show all of the details on how they were made. I will link the playlist for that series up above and down below in the description if you'd like to check any of those videos out. Recently, one of you suggested that I should do a video on how to go about starting an antique clothing collection and how to find and purchase antique clothing pieces. And this is that video. Most of my antique clothing finds have been through eBay, so that is what this video is going to primarily focus on. However, you can find antique clothing at antique stores, on Etsy, or through Instagram sellers. I think some of the tips here could easily apply to antique stores, but honestly, purchasing on Etsy or through Instagram tends to be a whole different ball game. That's because most of what you find on Etsy or with vintage and antique sellers on Instagram is incredibly curated. These are sellers who know what they have, who tend to have pieces in very good condition, and who tend to focus specifically on selling vintage or antique clothing. On Instagram especially, sellers can rely on a base audience of other collectors and can price things way higher than, in my opinion at least, those pieces may be worth. Likewise, prices on Etsy are also almost always quite high. So instead, let's talk about eBay and, to a lesser degree, antique stores. In both of these places, you will often find sellers who are generalists. These sellers sell all sorts of antique or vintage items. Look through most antique stores and it's rare to find a store or booth that focuses solely on clothing. Most have china, knickknacks, furniture, etc. all mixed in. The same can be said of most eBay stores, though on eBay you do have a few sellers who do specialize in antique clothing. Whenever you generalize in anything, you're less likely to know exactly what it is you have. Thus, you often find clothing pieces that are misdated or mislabeled, and the clothing doesn't tend to be in as good of condition. That said, and this may be a polarizing opinion, the condition of an item should not be your biggest concern. Most of us who are looking at and collecting antique clothing are not doing so to assemble a museum exhibition where everything needs to be in perfect condition. We're also not collecting them to wear the pieces, or at least, I really hope we're not, because that is pretty much the easiest way to have them break down even further. We, and I mostly mean costumers here, are purchasing these pieces for research reasons, so that we can look through our collection to find out how things were actually made, what pattern pieces look like, how they were finished, what types of fabrics were used, etc. And in these cases, it's actually often easier to discern how exactly they were made if the piece is not in perfect condition. Of course, I do not mean you should go out and buy something that is completely shattered or covered in moth holes or missing parts, etc. But if the lining is torn in several places or there's a large hole in the elbow or the hem is tattered, that can actually be extremely helpful. If you've seen a few of my antique examination videos, you will know that this is true. Some of my best preserved pieces have also been the biggest mysteries because it's very difficult to get in and see how they were made. So all that said, let's talk about what you want to look for and what you want to avoid when shopping for antique pieces. And again, we're pretty much just going to use eBay here as an example. The first and most important thing is that you need to set yourself a budget. If you have $50 to spend, you have $50 to spend. Yes, it really sucks if you get outbid and winds up selling for $51. Believe me, I've been there. But losing track of your budget is a dangerously slippery slope. You can find bodices on eBay for $20. You can also find bodices on eBay for $250. You have to know yourself and what you are willing to pay before you even open up the eBay app or website. For me personally, I tend to have a low budget. Honestly, 
I don't like to pay over $50 for any one piece, though if it's a full dress or a skirt bodice combo, then I might go up to about $65. And this includes the shipping. In fact, be quite careful about shipping prices because a lot of eBay listings come from overseas sellers, where not only are you dealing with things in other monetary units, but the shipping can also be quite steep. Take the time to do the math and make sure that you are including the shipping rates within your budget. A few years ago, you used to be able to find a lot in the $50 and under range. Now, it tends to be a lot more difficult. Whether this is due to the popularity of people like Abby Cox showing antique collections to large audiences online, or whether it's just because with the passage of time, antiques get older and more rare, we'll probably never know. Just know that in that price range of $50 and under, you're going to see a lot of petticoats, corset covers, shirtwaists, etc. And if that's what you're looking for, great! If not, it requires a bit more patience to find something within your budget. Because that's the next thing you're going to want to think about. What exactly is it that you're looking for? When I first started collecting, I was looking for pretty much anything. My first several pieces wound up being a real mix of things, with a few capelets, a dress, several bodices, a petticoat, a corset, some boots, etc. However, in more recent years, my search has been much more specific. Now, as far as bodices are concerned, I look for things I don't yet have in my collection. Maybe that's an interesting color, fabric pattern, or fabric texture, or a unique cut to the bodice, or how the closures operate on the bodice. Maybe it's a specific era, since, as you know if you saw the video on my blue 1880s bodice, that that was the first and only bustle era bodice that I own, and it took me years until I was able to get one of that era. I tend to be less specific about characteristics of dresses or bodice and skirt combos, just because I have way less of them, and they're also a lot harder to find within my budget. However, they are also much more difficult to store since they take up so much room, so I really have to be conscious of condition at the very least. But since they're usually way out of my price range anyway, it's not the biggest deal. As a whole, unless something is just ridiculously cheap, I don't buy shirtwaists, petticoats, or other undergarments, black bodices because I already have a whole lot of them, capelets, anything newer than the 19-teens, which in my mind it then turns into vintage, not antique, or anything in a volatile condition. In fact, let's talk about volatile conditions for a moment. I mentioned that things don't have to be in wonderful condition, but you also have to be careful about things that could be volatile. An example of this would be when you look at a piece made of silk and it's in some level of shattering. Shattering silk is often due to it having been made of weighted silk. Because historically silk was sold by weight, it was often treated with metallic salts containing things like tin, iron, or lead. These would give lightweight silks more body and luster, but over time, those metallic salts have actually sliced into the silk fibers, creating a shattering effect, basically shredding the fabric into bits. Once the silk starts shattering, it's never going to stop, and there's really no way to stabilize it. For this reason, I highly recommend avoiding silks in any state of shattering. Likewise, you have to be quite careful about pieces with signs of moth holes. You just never know when those moth holes may have been created. It could be new or it could be 100 years old. So there's always some risk that that cute woolen bodice you see in that eBay listing could have a much more recent moth problem. By bringing a piece like that into your home, you risk moths getting into not only the rest of your antique collection, but your wardrobe and your home as a whole. Thus, if you see signs of moth damage in an eBay listing, I would recommend passing on that listing. But let's go back a few steps. How do you even find pieces on eBay in the first place? What do you search for? Luckily, eBay has actually made it fairly easy to find what you're looking for. When you open up eBay, you can do a search for something like antique bodice, as you see here. Now, eBay is actually already pretty smart, so it has automatically categorized my search within the vintage clothing section of eBay. However, 
I'm not interested in anything more recent than the 19 teens. So now I can go into the filter category for decades and select all of the time periods I'm interested in. I'm first going to select pre-1890s, 1890s, 1900s, and 19 teens. However, you will notice that down at the bottom, there are two boxes called unknown and unspecified. Although checking these boxes will give you a lot more results to wade through, they can also present to you with some of the best deals. The best prices will almost always come from someone who doesn't know what they have. Maybe they were clearing out their attic, or they've just inherited a bunch of stuff from a relative, or whatever the case may be. If they're not even able to put a guess on the era, they probably don't know what they have, they may not even care what they have, and are likely to price it accordingly. So I recommend checking these boxes. You can then go back up to the top and select Save Search. If you're actively looking for something, go ahead and check the box for email notifications, since you will then get a daily digest every morning of what has been posted in the last 24 hours. If you're not actively looking for something, don't check any notification boxes. You can always access your saved search from your eBay profile menu using the lines in the upper left hand corner. Once you have your search set up, let's talk about types of eBay listings. There are three types here. The auction style, which requires bids and ends at a certain time, usually within about seven days of when it was listed. The buy it now style, which gives one set price, and if you like that price, you just purchase it. And then the buy it now or best offer, which is one of my favorites. You can either pay the price they have listed or see if they're willing to go lower. Don't super lowball the seller because they'll undoubtedly say no, as in like, don't offer $50 for a bodice listed for 150, but if that bodice is listed for $60, maybe they'd be willing to take 50 instead. They have, I believe, 24 hours to respond to your offer. And if they turn it down, you either increase your offer, assuming that it still fits in your budget, or you move on to the next piece. When I'm scrolling through the listings, I mainly focus on price first with a quick glance to the preview image to see if it looks interesting. The reason I don't solely focus on price is because occasionally I'll save a listing for later just so that I can use the pictures in that listing as research, even if I know I'm never going to attempt to purchase it. This is particularly great for when you see those wonderful museum quality pieces that occasionally turn up for several hundred dollars or more. Definitely just use those listing pictures as research, save it to your Pinterest, your hard drive, etc., so that you can revisit them later. Anyway, if I see a listing whose price fits in my budget and has an interesting preview image, I click into the listing. I usually start by looking through all of the pictures, enlarging them to see any details such as the condition it's in. Once I've gone through the pictures, if I'm still interested, I will read the description as well, since this is usually where the seller will put in more details such as the condition or occasionally add things like size or when it was from or if it was a family item. If the description sounds good and if it's an auction, I'll add it to my watched items by clicking the little heart and then I'll return to that listing within the last day of the auction to see if it still fits in my budget at that point. If it's a buy it now or best offer though, and it's one that fits in your budget and one that you would like to own, you may as well purchase it or put it in an offer as soon as you see it. If you do decide to purchase something, I recommend looking at that seller's other listings as well. There's always a chance that they've listed multiple clothing items that may interest you and that they'll combine shipping if you purchase more than one piece. Just message them about combined shipping if they don't specify it in the listing. Make sure that you're ready for any pieces that you do decide to order. You'll want to have acid-free boxes and acid-free tissue paper at home to store your new collection in. I just purchased mine at the container store. Make sure that the box will arrive before your new antique piece does. And if you'd like to see specifically how I store and organize my antique collection, check out this video, which I have linked up above and down below. One additional tip. You may sometimes see costumes mixed into the listings of antique garments, and you will definitely see non-antique garments mixed in as well, especially if you mark the unknown and unspecified boxes. These costumes will normally be pretty darn obvious. However, sometimes costumes can look a lot like historical pieces, 
to the point where the seller may not realize it's not actually an antique piece. Or on the flip side of that, you may see something that looks very costumey due to alteration it has received over time, even though the base of the garment is actually an antique. The brown turn of the century bodice that I purchased last year was a good example of this, since someone had added a bunch of really inappropriate lace to it. I'll link that video up above and down below also if you haven't seen that. I want to show you all a recent piece that I had at first bid on, but then decided not to raise my bid after looking much closer at the pictures. It gave me a red flag that made me think, this may be a vintage costume, but not actually as old as it's supposed to be. This looks like it's supposed to be a dress from the late 1860s or early 1870s at first, but then you notice that there is a line of stitching going haphazardly across the skirt pleats and waistband and a matching line of stitching going across the pleats in the lower back of the bodice on the exterior. These could very well be poorly done men's that were performed at some point, or it could be a sign that it was originally made as a theatrical garment. It's just so hard to tell. In the end, it went for about triple my budget anyway, so it really didn't matter. And I do hope that the buyer wound up with a dress that really is from the 1860s or 70s. Also, just a little heads up, if you save a search like Vintage Victorian like I have, you are going to get a bunch of 1990s Victoria's Secret underwear mixed in. Uh, yeah, it's weird. In any case, that is all I have for you today. Do you have any additional tips for buying antique clothing? Please let me know. Also, do you already have an antique clothing collection or are you planning to start collecting? Because I would love to hear all about your collection. By the way, I may not always have a chance to respond to your comments, but I promise I do read all of them. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful for you. If you liked this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram. So please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi account down in the description below. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon and Angela. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful week and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!